This is a video about Sri Aurobindo's Life Divine, Book 1, Chapter 11 and 12, Delight of Existence, the Problem, and Delight of Existence, the Solution. In which Sri Aurobindo also deals with the age-old question, why is there suffering in this world? Good morrow, this is Chris speaking. Wake up with another video about Shurabindo's Life Divine, this time the 11th and 12th chapter, which deal with the delight, with Ananda, bliss. Thank you for liking and subscribing. At the same time, when we think about bliss, we immediately realize that there is a discrepancy. How can the Vedic seers and how can Shurabindo talk about bliss when this is not what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. To the contrary, we have to ask if this world is so blissful, why is there suffering in this world? We have seen in the last two chapters that existence, force and consciousness are one thing, one trinity. Three words for an almost indescribable absolute. And that Shurabindu equates all three, Sat, Existence, Chit, Conscious Force, and Ananda, Bliss, with a supramental consciousness. Not a mental one, a supramental one, beyond the limits of the human mind. A complete awareness and thus probably an omnipotence. So the question arises, if this absolute consciousness is omnipotent, could it not have created a perfect world without suffering? So let us have a closer look at Ananda, bliss, delight of existence. Theologists have been trying to solve this question of why there is pain, suffering and evil in this world for more than 2500 years. The logic was as follows. If we humans with our feeble minds can imagine a more perfect world than this, then the omnipotent divine surely can as well. So why hasn't it created it? Or why does it not change it now into perfection? Shubindu would say it does. The world is being changed into perfection as we speak. And we are part of this endeavor. But his main argument is very similar to the one of the previous chapter with the conscious force. Our definition and expectations of the words bliss and delight are based on human moments of ecstasy and acceleration, on our definitions of the words, like an orgasm, for example, or parachuting, or dancing, or a drug high, or eating gourmet delicacy, or whatever gives you the most pleasure, this is your association with those words. But it is not about pleasure, as UG has explained perfectly. Our body cannot even stand intense pleasure for very long. Nevertheless, we still continue seeking a state of unending pleasure, or at least of happiness. The pursuit of happiness, most people would say, is the aim in human life. Well, that may be, but that is not what the Vedas mean with bliss, delight, ananda. It is not our kind of delight or even a more intense form of our human pleasure sensations or happiness. It is the delight of existence, that things and beings exist at all, brings delight to the Absolute. Jed McKenna describes this very well. Imagine you are an all-present, all-knowing, all-powerful, eternal being. Of course, you cannot imagine that, but try anyway, as an experiment. Now, not only that you are everything, there is nothing that is not you. And even if you create something out of nothing, you are still it, and it is still you, and you know it. So to summarize this state in an uncouth way, it is likely to be very boring at least after a few million years or so. So, as this omnipotent being, you have to devise a plan, a cunning scheme, 
to get some company or at least some entertainment without being aware of it fully that you are it. Imagine playing your favorite game with yourself all the time and you always tie. You can never win or lose because you always know what your game partner is thinking and doing because he or she is also you. A few million years of playing chess against yourself will bore you out of your wits. So you create Maya, a many-leveled veil which gives a part of you the illusion of forgetting who you really are. And then you can watch your own Alzheimer aspects trying to remember they are you. Splendid entertainment. Imagine what kind of movies or series or novels or games you like. Think about it. What do you enjoy most? What's your favorite movie or your favorite book? Most likely a film or a book or a game that offers some kind of suspense. May it be of the romantic sort or humoristic or action or sports, it doesn't matter. This fictional reality gives you suspense and thus joy. By things not working perfectly. There are obstacles and misunderstanding and unfairness and so on. And while this is Jet's version, not sure Bindo's, I think he would have liked it. Plus, we need not worry, because nothing bad can and could possibly happen. All is well, as it is going according to plan, obeying a higher will. Not just your plan, and not just our will, but a higher plan and a higher will. And we will never know nor understand what this is exactly. And this is called Leela, the cosmic game in Sanskrit, Leela. And this infinitely complex game is what brings self-delight to the pure existence, to the absolute. And it is a game of becoming, not just of being. Only being probably gets boring if the divine can experience something like boredom. But becoming can never be or become boring. It is eternal and it is endless in its variations. And it is not measured in our human categories of good and bad and neutral or pleasure and pain and indifference to choose other words for the same experience. For the divine it is always a delight no matter what happens. The nature of suffering, Shurabindo writes, is a failure to meet the shocks of existence. Our receptors, limited by the ego shell, cannot fully connect to the conscious force and thus get used to defend against it and fight back, kind of. What we experience as suffering is the constant shrinking and concentration of cosmic force in and around us. So we are a little bit like tiny black holes and space-time bends in and around us. And this is what we call suffering, pain and evil. It is really a self-centered misinterpretation of what is going on, namely nature or Maya or the divine plan taking its course. And we are trying all that we can to stand against it because we feel threatened by it. This is why we have to start at the bottom, not at the top. In our yoga, whatever you call your journey. And Shurubindo was attempting to establish a stronger or more harmonious link between the supramental and our material world and our human life of struggle. So that we can fit better into the higher plan and action and not get pummeled around like some driftwood. But to achieve the highest, you have to dig a deep foundation first. We have to go way down, like Savitri or like Orpheus, down into the underworld and face our worst fears and deepest programs.
And then there, at the very bottom, surprisingly, we will find trust and surrender. Surrender to the tide of the universe. And once we have surrendered, a new will will emerge, and not an ego desire. That is the very strange thing about Sri Aurobindo's Integral Yoga, and that is why I said that actually one would have to study the life divine and the synthesis of yoga in parallel. The Integral Yoga is a peculiar mixture of surrender and willpower. But first the surrender has to take place. And this takes place by going deep down into matter and ignorance. First to explore our own underworld and then surrender takes place. And this is why Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga have a prominent place here as well as Tantra. Watch my video on Tantra, the real Tantra. And then we find out that there is no evil mechanism out there trying to stop us. The whole of creation is a wake-up mechanism, like a huge hide-and-seek game. And hide-and-seek is no fun if you know where the other one is hiding and what he or she is thinking while in a hiding. It is only fun when you seek without knowing. And then the greatest joy is finding and being found. And here it is similar. The journey towards so-called enlightenment is the whole point. And when you finally realize that you are the divine and the divine is you, when you and the pure existence smile at each other in recognition, you say something like, Oh, hello, it's you. It's you. And then the Absolute says, welcome. Yes, it's me. It has always been me. Or something like this. And therefore it is helpful to assume that all is well and that Maya is not the enemy, just the game setting. So the Divine can be omnipotent and still create a world which appears not to be perfect. Nor does the Divine have to be cruel to allow such a world. Nor does it have to be a passive observer who just created everything and is now absent. No, all these three common interpretations or misinterpretations are not necessary. They are not the end of reasoning. All possibilities, all of them, are inherent in an infinite existence. It cannot be otherwise. It is infinite. And so the possibility of our own world is one of them. Why not? And in our world, such a Dananda is concealed from us, unfortunately. Or fortunately, who knows? And the infinite consciousness loses itself in appearances, in the illusion of insensible matter, and in the illusion of a limited mind and ego, and in the illusion of separation from the whole. But these infinite possibilities of creation bring delight to the whole, as does the uncovering and dissolution of the illusion that also brings delight. And delight is not something akin to our exhilaration when we feel very happy. That's not the same. The divine delight just is. It is not positive or negative or neutral. It is just the joy of being involved in creation, like Shiva's dance or Lila's game the dance or game of itself is the delight. The dance or game itself. The delight of existence and of manifestation. And we as humans can feel it a bit, to some degree. Yet it is not comparable to any emotion or sensation we know. So there is no point in looking for it while expecting a certain feeling. It's not a human emotional sensation. Same with divine love or compassion. It is not a human emotion or a desire or pity. 
It is divine. It is very, very subtle. It is the opposite of intense, which is how most people imagine it. It is subtle, but at the same time all-pervading, everywhere and always here and now. So when we think of delight of Ananda, we should not expect it to be something that we have already experienced, something that we know only more extreme. It's something completely different. And this is the, our expectations are the main reason why we do not experience it, why we do not sense it or see it, because we expect something that it is not. So when you hear things like divine love and divine bliss, just be open to it. It's not something you know already. And at the same time, it's something you have felt always, but only very, very low volume in the background. And it is also important to understand that just as we are forced to wander this maze, the labyrinth of ignorance, it is also a certain fact to Shurabindo that we have to arrive at the end of it at some point. A superconscious self-possession, an awakening to the truth must happen eventually. We have to awake from this divine half-dream of the one at last. And this is the solution to the apparent problem of Ananda. There is no evil, there is only a very complex game of self-awakening, which is described very well in the next chapter, which is of course about Maya, about this infamous labyrinth and veil that hinders us to see what really is. This grand hide-and-seek game that is set up and in which we have lost ourselves. That's it for today. Thank you to all my patrons. Thank you for liking and subscribing. Thank you for joining me on Patreon or Facebook. And see you soon.